Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us again this week. My name is Sue Shardlow. I'm the Developer Community Manager here at Redis, and I've got with me my colleague, Justin Castilla, Developer Advocate here at Redis. Um, why we're here? Well, if you've watched the first two videos in this series, which are on YouTube, then you'll know that we're here to learn all about Redis data structures. We're taking RU101. I'm new to the company, so as part of my onboarding, I'm doing this course, and I love to do things in the most challenging way. So I thought, yeah, why not learn in public in front of the whole world? So here we are. <laughs> um, so what I really want to stress to you is this is just a bit of fun and a supplement to the course. You're very welcome to join me on the course. It is free of charge to enroll. So you need to go to university.redis.com and sign up there to RU101. You've got until Tuesday to do that, Tuesday the 26th of October. But uh, once you've signed up, then you'll have until the 11th of November to complete all the assessments if you want to get the certificate. So I really do encourage you to sign up now if you want to join us for this cohort. Um, you've got until Tuesday the 26th of October to do that. If you don't do that, then you'll have to wait till the November 1 and uh, enrolments will open for that soon. The course is six weeks long, but don't worry. Um, it probably won't take you a full six weeks to do it. I've been doing it now for the past two weeks and I've been spending about an hour a week looking at the videos and doing some of the homework questions. I have um, skipped over some of the homework questions and I'm gonna come back to them because I do need to go back and review some videos. But the first pass through and doing some of the homeworks has only taken me about an hour a week. So don't worry about that, it's completely self-paced. So I'll hand over to Justin in a second. But what we're going to cover today is we're going to go do a quick recap of lists, sorted sets, um, and then we're going to look at faceted search and big O notation, which Justin has assured everybody last week that it is not scary. It's a perfectly natural part of life. So let's talk about big O notation. And um, yes, so I just also want to give a shout out to Simon Prickett, who's our developer advocacy manager who is controlling the uh, all the little captions that you can see and all the links and things like that. He's also monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions for us, please do post them in the chat and uh, we will get to them. So yeah, over to you, Justin. Hello, how are you today? I'm doing really great. Plenty of coffee in my gigantic cup. So we're gonna go real fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, cool. So. Yeah, so what I wanted to do this morning is just a quick little warm up on lists, just so we can get back in the mind of, of data structures. So lists um, are a collection of elements. Uh, they can be strings or they can be any kind of binary safe content up to 512 megabytes. That's pretty big. Um, so just sort of continuing on with our last week's example of a radio station, um, I wanna continue um, entering songs into a list. And we'll just look at that really quick. So um, we're going to start sharing my screen here. Oop, there we go. All right. Um, so I'm just going to paste in my L push command. L push enters elements, one or more elements into a list. And so this you'll see in the beginning L push. And then I'm going to create a list called last five played. So I'm going to imagine my radio station has online a list of the last five songs played. So if you hear that song, you come back and like, what was that? That was awesome. Well, this is be this would be the list you'd be looking at. So I'll press enter, and that's a lot of different songs. Um, and again, the command, if I want to look at all of the songs, is L range, and then the name of the list, last five played. And then the start and the stop. The start is at index zero, and the negative one brings us all the way to the end. And there we go. There's all the songs. Um, yeah. So and this is this is good work music. Philip Glass, Colin Stetson, uh, Hilder Gudnadotter. Uh, just found out about her. She's an amazing movie composer. Uh, great stuff. Vangelis, because I just wanted to get some some old school. So you might be noticing that this isn't the last five played. Oops, <laughs> there's too many elements in this list. So if I want to actually find out uh, how many elements are in this list, the actual quantity, uh, there's a command called ln. Now, one thing to note is 
the L and LN, it doesn't stand for left like L push does. It just stands for list. So list length. So just a small little thing to, to keep um, aware of when you're playing with some of these commands. So I'll just enter LN and then the key. So last five played. And there we go. I see I have uh, 10 in my uh, list. So uh, I want five because this is the last five play. Um, so I want to use the command L trim. Now, again, L trim is list trim, not left trim. So it's important to, to remember that. And so uh, the key will be last five. Oh, I'm sorry, last the number five played. And then I'm going to enter the start and stop of where I want to um, keep it. So I want to keep the last five to nine. I think that's that's where it goes. So I'm going to get rid of the first five. I'm pretty sure. Let me check. So now I trimmed. And it says, OK. So now let me call L range again. Yeah, OK. So it kept the last five, not uh, deleted the last five. So now I have uh, the length of my list. Call it again. Is now set to five. So L trim. Uh, will trim your list to the specified uh, range that you give them. Uh, LN will give you a quick single integer return, as opposed to L range, which will give you all the content back. So just a couple of new commands and just a reminder of what L range does. Um, so yeah, here are the last five uh, songs that we played, and I can display that on our on our website. Maybe. Uh, we'll have like links to you know the songs or anything like that you want to purchase. Um, you want to do this programmatically. So as you add a new song, you'll want to verify that um, you have five or more. If you have more than five, uh, then you'll want to, with your client, reduce it to five from six or what have you. So cool. All right. So now that our brains are kind of running with the mindset of lists and elements and stuff like that, um, I want to go over sorted sets. So um, Suze, so what were some like uh, attributes of sets? Like what are some cool things about sets that we went over last week? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to kind of put this out there. It's a bit of a random comment. And seeing as how we've got another English person in the mix here in the form of Simon Prickett, I would really love to know if we might have a language barrier here because the commands start with what we would call a Z. Oh, yes, but you yeah. call a Z. So I would really love to know if any, uh, if anyone else here is watching from the UK or somewhere where you call that letter Z, please tell me, do you refer to these commands as Z, Z range or Z range? I would really love to know that because uh, I'm going to find it quite hard to get my head around that. But just, um, yeah, <laughs> go on. I'll just, I'll just pronounce it Zad and Z range. <laughs> Zad, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that I think that works. Um, so yeah, a set. Everything it only contain, contains unique values. Perfect. Is something I remember. So you can't have duplicates. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's exactly it. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the, a list and a set are different, and the, a list you can have multiple of the exact same element. So I could play. Philip Glass's Glassworks opening twice in a row at my radio station, and I'd be maintaining a list. But if we were doing a, a set, I couldn't do it twice. It would say, oh, it's it's in there. I'm not going to allow this to be played a second time. Um, and then do you remember set theory? Um, is this where you can look at the intersection and the difference and the intersection difference and everything a uh, union union that's it <laughs> yeah yeah everything. Exactly. <laughs> everything. <laughs> um so yeah we have uh difference which uh given the first set will tell you what this first set has that the second hat doesn't that's difference intersection given um more than one set, it will tell you what all of them have in common. And then uh, union just gives you everything between multiple sets. Um, so what we'll go over is a sorted set. And a sorted set is just like a set in that you have unique 
uh, elements, uh, unique members only. Um, and you can do intersections, differences, and unions. But the big difference is that they all have these scores associated with them. So it's sorted based off of these scores. So uh, you give, uh, you actually enter the score along with the member and you can have the score be, you know, how many times people have played it before, um, how many likes, how many listens you can see on the radio while you're playing, if it's like streaming online, um, or, you know, just any kind of like how much I like it, you can give it a numerical score and it will be sorted in the set at all times. So as you enter it into the set for the first time and you give it a score, it will be located where it should go and go, it'll plunk it in there and it will stay there until you either change a score or add or remove some other element or member next to it. And then it has to like, you know, rearrange it. Um, but this is really cool for maintaining a sorted set and displaying it in a sorted manner. So this would be really great for like maybe top 10 or top five or top three tracks or um, really, really big at a leaderboard, which is a, 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 you know, sort of a data structure or a data scheme that we use a lot in like video games. If you want to see the top five players of a specific region or of, you know, all time, or you can do an intersection of both of those. Um, or if you say, you're a top five at the Super Mario Brothers, and you're top five in, you know, a Metroid, to bring out some really old Nintendo games, you can actually find the intersection. Who's top five in Metroid and Super Mario Brothers, which is really hard, but I'm sure there's somebody who's, who, who does that. So you can run intersections on these sets that already have sorted amounts, which is actually really, really nice. So, um, Going on with the uh, idea of a leaderboard, I kind of enrolled us all in the video game. <laughs> and we're all doing really well, um, but I want to actually uh, add the, um, sorry, I'm gonna add all of us into a sorted set here. So I'm gonna use um, ZAD or ZAD. <laughs> Kind of fun to say. Uh, you're learning. Like <laughs> <laughs> and then let me uh, let's call it player colon leaderboard. And again, that colon just separates uh, strings to allow us humans to understand it a little bit better. And then I'm just going to continue with um, just a bunch of our names in within our game and our scores. So I'm going to do it score first. Um, and then name. So I'm just going to paste in all of them. So let's go back to the front. So we have the Susanator, which is you. Uh, you have uh, 1,220,000 points. And I love it because I, I was always rubbish at video games. So oh, I'm no, really glad you played my score. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm here uh, just in time uh, for 333,450. And I went through a lot of us. Uh, Kyle O, our video guy, um, he's in there. And then who else do we have? Uh, your guy, Royce. So Guy Royce. Steve, Dodge and Weave, he's in there. Uh, Brian <laughs> the Conqueror, Alexander the Great, and of course, Simon. So everybody's in here. Not everybody, but anybody who likes to play games is in here. Yeah, while you're mentioning Kyle, actually, and Alexander, I do want to give a shout out to Kyle, Alex, and uh, Josephine and our video team who uh -huh. are really helping us to get these things up on YouTube <laughs> as well after the fact. So, uh, yeah, if you ever do want to come back to these recordings, please find them on YouTube where our lovely video team have kindly put these videos up for you. <laughs> yeah, if there's any huge major flub, they can just scrub it from our memories, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's never happened. <laughs> Um, yeah, you'll notice that these I'm inputting these scores in no particular order. I mean, so I'm always going to be assigned this number. Kyle's going to be assigned this number, but they don't have to be in order as I put them in, basically. So um, as I put them in and press enter, um, then they're going to actually put them in order and I can actually inspect them. So Z range, uh, Z range, Z range. And this is very similar to uh, L range. So we'll put in the key. So leaderboard, 
and then the cursor uh, start and stop so zero negative one and there we go so this is actually going to show us the sorted set now something to remember is the sorted set starts from the lowest score to the highest score so brian has a pretty low score we can't see it susanator has the highest score so that's awesome um but it's not very helpful if we don't really see the scores so what we can do is we'll call the command again z range player oops leaderboard zero negative one and then you'll see right here we have the optional with scores so i'm going to actually add that with scores and let's see what that gives us okay so now we see the score associated with the player name or the member uh, of the sorted set and so you see it starts at 22,000, then 95,000, then 115,000. So it's going from all the way down to the bottom, all the way to the top. So cool. Now, this is great, um, but if we want to actually call this with a client um, for a website, if we just want to display the top three, you would have to call Z range, and then you'd have to figure out the last you know, uh, cursor, last end of the list, and to call that. And that just, it doesn't very, it just doesn't feel very good to do that. So there's actually a command called Z rev range. And that's actually going to reverse the sorted set as it gives it back to you. So instead of having the lowest score, it's going to act like the beginning of the sorted set is the highest score. So here's a little clue as well for folks that are doing this week's work this week um yeah. in the homework don't be tripped up by range and rev range so if it's asking you which values are going to be returned when you type this in make sure you check and see if it's range or with or rev range because it may seem a little bit counterintuitive that the way you would get it back by default is from lowest to highest because if you're looking at a proper leaderboard normally you would get it from highest to lowest so uh, yeah, that's one that I had to really kind of wrap my brain around when I was doing the homework. Same with me. <laughs> when I, first <laughs> I always especially with all those, range. especially with all those negative numbers as well. I was like, right, okay, we're starting at the end and the beginning, and like, is it going to come back backwards or forwards? And yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, using Z rev range, I'll still use the start and stop zero and negative one. And let's use with scores, because I know that's just going to give me all the scores. So based off of this, there we go. So our first entry is Susanator. Congratulations. Um, and we have your score of 1,220,000. Then we have Alexander, and then Royce, and then Justin, and then Steve, Simon, Kyle, and Brian. Um, cool. So we now have our entire list, and that's great. Um, and if we want to find, if we just, if Steve logs in and wants to find his position, um, what we can do is use Z rev rank. So that's a whole nother thing. So Z rev, so we're going to actually get the sort of set back reversed and then rank. We want to look up, um, a specific member and I want to look up player colon leaderboard. And then we'll just enter Steve, Dodge, and Weave. <laughs> this is the actual <laughs> member name. And it gives us the rank of uh, his position within a reverse sorted set, which gives us four. So zero, one, two, three, and four. So there we go. Now, if we want to find, um, let's see here. So the top three players with the highest scores. Um, so let's actually do a Z rev range player leaderboard zero and two with scores. So this is going to actually give us um, the top three. So it goes zero, one, and two. And there we go, Susanator, Alexander, and your guy Royce. So these uh, would be displayed maybe on the dashboard of our game lobby or something like that. Um, 
Cool. And now say you want to find who is above and below uh, Simon. So if you don't know, like, who's the person right above and ranked right below Simon, and Simon wants to figure out, like, I need to find this guy, this person in the game, and I want to, like, you know, win uh, against them. So you'll do Z rev rank player leaderboard. What I'm doing now is determining where Simon is in the in the ranking. And so now he's five. So now I'm going to find out who's number four and who's number six. So um, to do that, we'll do Z rev range player leaderboard. And now one, I don't see it kind of hit it, but I remember Simon was uh, five. So I want to go from four to six. That's going to show me Simon in the middle. So Steve Dodge and Weave is uh, with has more points than Simon, and Kyle Oh No has less points than Simon. So Simon needs to make sure he doesn't get attacked by Kyle Oh No, or he doesn't lose against him. But Simon also needs to make sure that he can beat Steve Dodge and Weave, so he can go up above in that um, in the sorted set. Kind of makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is a lot of stuff that goes on when you're maintaining a leaderboard um, in the background when you go to these dashboards and player rankings and stuff like that. But once you have it set up in your client, when, when you're using JavaScript or Python, it becomes pretty much automatic. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing all this, you know, actual entering of commands. But the main thing that I recommend to really get comfortable with um, uh, working of sorted sets is to just do the homework, do the quizzes, and just do it over and over and over again so you can actually get a feel for how it works. Uh, what I did is I challenged myself a lot, like, you know, how can we actually find, you know, the third to the last or the fifth to the last or fifth to the first? Um, and getting really comfortable um, imagining Z rev range and Z range, just knowing which direction we go. Um, <laughs> fun little background, the video that we did uh, for sorted sets was so hard because I had to just uh, juggle the concepts of these sorted sets. Are they going forward? Or are they going backwards when I'm talking about this? And I think we actually had to do a little bit of an addendum on it. Um, but it's, it's hard stuff. But once you actually like work with it more and more and more, it get, you get really, really comfy with it. So, OK. Yeah. Um, Interesting that um, the command says with scores. So it's clearly it was kind of intuitively set up to do this kind of use case, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, the more deep we get into Redis through this course, we'll see more and more the, the intentions of um, you know those that contributed to the Redis platform. Um, all the commands have a reason for it. They're not just like fun little commands. Um, they all have you know an, a purpose and intention. And Redis wants to be really, really fast, really, really efficient, but they also want to make sure that you have exactly what you need. And so, yeah, with with, with scores as an option, um, this gives you exactly what you want, the scores. Or if you don't need the scores at any given time, you can just skip it. So it gives you some uh, some savings on time. So um, that was our first jump into sorted sets. Now, the cool thing about sorted sets is that we can actually uh, run set theory on them. Uh, so we can intersect them, we can run difference, and we can also run union. And that gets really, really cool. That like, That's where it gets really powerful. We'll end up doing faceted searches, which um, that's going to be with sets. But this, uh, yeah, this is just really neat. Um, so I'm going to create two uh, different uh, sorted sets. Now we're going to have two radio stations. We're going to have KRDS, uh, the one I was on when we were doing lists, it's going to have the top 10 songs. And we're also going to have KSQL, KSQL, which, you know, is our sister station. We're good friends. And we're both going to have top 10 lists. So um, here I am entering um, the KRDS. And I'm I'm copying and pasting a lot of this, this boilerplate code just so we can sort of focus on the results, not, you know, watching me type. This is also available for you as a gist. So if you're coding at home or if you want to actually run these all, uh, all these commands, you can actually paste along. So uh, we'll enter um, that just real quick for you. 
and um, you'll be able to do this. So I'm adding with Z add um, to station ARDS play count. This is going to be just track all the play counts. Um, and then here is the score. So Hatchie is the artist and the song is This Enchanted. We'll say that they played 135 times this week, which is a pretty good amount. Um, and then we'll have another song, maybe uh, artist is Gabriel's song is called Blame. Uh, the play count was 98 this week. And again, they're not in any numerical order as they paste them in. So you don't have to worry about how you enter them. So I'll press enter. All right. So KRDS is now a sorted set inside um, our, our Redis Insight. And now let me add another station, KSQL. And I'm just going to call it station colon KSQL. And there we go. So now we have two sorted sets. Now let's actually run some uh, uh, set intersection. So with sorted sets, we use Z. And I'm going to use Z interstore. Now, interstore does us a favor. It actually creates a new key based off of the intersection that we give it. So it, hence the word store. So this one has quite a few um, quite a few things to put in. You'll see we have destination, which is going to be the new key that we're creating. Num keys, which is it's asking how many keys are we going to be placing in. In this case, we're going to be placing in two keys to intersect. And then we can actually change the weighting of the scoring. And we can ask it to sum it, min, and max it with an aggregation. So that's that's a bit advanced, but there's a lot of things we can do with um, our intersections with sorted sets. So Z interstore. And then I'm going to call it maybe station, colon, both, colon. Let's call it top three. So let's say I'm going to get the top three. Uh, most played uh, songs between both stations. And then I'm going to give it the num keys, which is two. So it's asking for how many sets we're going to be giving it. And then I'm just going to give it both sets. So station KRDS play count. And then station KSQL play count. And now it's going to give me a whole new key of station both top three. So let's check that out. Let's check out Z rev range station colon both colon top three and start and stop. And there we go. So there's all of the songs that both um, KRDS and KSQL have in common. And I can do width scores. So let's inspect the scores. And now you can see the sum of both of the numbers that we had for KRDS and KSQL. So Trace Leches had 312 total between the two. And so this actually maintains the scoring. So now we can actually you know, keep, it, keep it in rank. So this is great, but my top three list has six songs. So we actually have to trim a couple out. So to do that, now this is this actually this trip me up. Uh, we do Z rem range by rank. There are so many commands uh, with sorted sets that look so similar. So it's really important to actually look up uh, the command list uh, within Redis IO, and you'll be able to see all the different commands and pick and choose which one you're looking for because they look so similar. You have to be really careful. So Z rem range by rank means that I'm just going to be removing um, some of these by their ranking. So notice it's not Z rev rem range. I don't even think that exists. We are removing by rank in its original form. Again, remember, uh, sorted sets go from lowest to highest. I want to keep the top three highest. So that means that I want to get rid of the top three or lower three lowest. Sorry. Um, zero through two is what I'm trying to say. So this is Z rev range. Let's, let's hold on. I want to just make sure that everybody sees this. Z range station both 
top three. Me futzing with my words is not going to get in our way. There we go. <laughs> oh, station. With scores? Oh, with scores, not score. Thank you. OK, so this is the original form of the sorted set. Uh, it goes from lowest at 200 to highest in 312. So when I call Z rem range by rank, I'm saying I want to get rid of the zero with, the one, <laughs> and the tooth. I want to get rid of all of these three. Um, and then I'll be left with the top three, which would be Hatchy, Jarb D, and Tres Leches. OK. So also I'll add in station, both top three. OK. So let's check out one more time the Z rev range with scores. And I should see my top three. All right, Trace Leches, Jarv D, and Hatchy. So there we go. Woof. Um, again, we're doing this by hand in uh, the command line. But if you do this with a client, you know, within your, your, your site design, this is just instantaneous. So you have no worries about actually remembering all this. Figure it out, do it once, and you're absolutely golden. Cool. Does that does that make sense? Has anything popped up or any bells or whistles gone off yet? Um, two thoughts that have popped into my mind. One is I really I'm here for seeing how long these commands can actually get as we progress through the course because we're only on week two now and that Z or Z rem range by rank is really long. Yes. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing where we end up in week six and also something that. I think uh, I didn't realize at first when we talk about sets and we say that they contain unique values, um, when you then come and um, intersect some sets, my understanding is, which wasn't in the first place, was that if you look at, say, um, what was the one when you say all, where you have everything that's in all the sets? Uh, when you have all, it's a union. Union, that's it, yeah. In my world, it said everything. But yeah, in, in your world, union. Um, then you still only have unique. So although these things may have existed in different sets, once you put them all together and look at them all um, in one um, list, you will still only have unique values. And I think I didn't quite appreciate that the first time because I'm thinking of a Venn diagram and I'm thinking, right, everything that I can see here on this diagram is going to be in my new um, list, but it isn't. Not every single instance, just one instance of each thing that appears. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the the sets when you when you run the set theory on them or union um, or everything, it yeah the they still maintain the uniqueness. So they're they'll take two two unique of the same member from two different sets, and they'll just turn them into one, um, which is the intended purpose yeah if, if you actually wanted to like count multiple instances um then you would be like instead of intersecting two lists you'd just be smashing two lists together which is you know perfectly adequate for when you're doing different things like that um and yeah these these commands they do get pretty long i'll be honest i'm pretty sure that sorted sets are the are the longer ones that you'll see um Geolocation, our geo data type, can get pretty wordy. Um, but of course, we'll have a whole video, a whole stream dedicated to geolocation. So, you know, we'll get used to it. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't, I can't uh, talk up our our command list, our Redis IO command list enough because it it divides it by uh, data type, and within that data type, it gives you all the commands. And then while you're looking at a specific command, you can see all the commands in like a little index on the side. It's just great, just hopping and skipping between all the different commands. And not everybody will enjoy it as much as I do, but I like reading it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fascinating, actually, because watching the videos um, in the course will definitely give you a taste and it will give you a good foundation. But when you click on the documentation and you see all the uh, the commands, then you realize actually the full capability of what you could do. So yeah, uh, yeah the, the videos literally just give you a taster because otherwise the course wouldn't be six weeks long, would it? No, no, be six not. months long. 
<laughs> and yeah, the, the documentation has like examples. It gives you the, the big O performance. So that's actually something pretty, pretty good to know. Um, and then it shows you what commands are very similar to that one. Um, so if you're really comfortable with lists or sets and you're not comfortable with sorted sets, you can sort of compare and contrast the different commands. Um, so that was sorted sets, which are basically just like sets, only with a ranking score attached to each member. And it just maintains it in order from lowest to highest. So now let's go back to sets and let's actually do something called a uh, faceted search. So sets are cool and you can intersect them and then show you the unique um, elements or members that both sets contain. Now that's really cool because you can start searching. Um, you can add filters, if you will. Say you have like uh, an e-commerce site and you wanna filter down, I want shoes that are red, um, size 13.5 for me, that's, 47 in the UK, I'm not sure. Um, and you know, maybe I want Velcro, not laces, because I don't like tying my shoes. I like using Velcro. Those are all different little filters that I can add um, to my search and they'll, they'll narrow down my results. Um, there's two ways, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we approach this uh, within the course. So in the course um, where we're using um, the Olympics, to look for venues with different features. We're narrowing it down by um, whether or not there's disabled access and whether or not um, it's a metal event. So is this going to actually produce like gold, silver, or bronze for one of the players and uh, where the actual venue is. So um, those are all sets. We have a set of um, events that have disabled access. We have a set of events that don't have disabled access. We have a set of places that do have metal events or events that are metal events. And we have sets that um, contain all events that do not have metals with them. And when you intersect those, you'll get um, more filtered results. Um, so let's actually take a look. Let me clear this out. So let's first look at some of these uh, sets that we have that uh, in RU101. And you should be able to grab these uh, if you in, in, installed the database data that we had from the beginning. So let's call, let's look up, let's see here, S range, FS metal event, false. Uh, maybe not S range, S scan. There we go. It was, is not giving me my hint. So here I am going to look at uh, the first uh, first couple events of the metal events. So these are all going to be um, event names. They, this is the actual SKU because the SKU is, a, is a, a unique ID to each event. So let me just check out the type of this event. So let me copy one in. And let me, I know it's type event colon. That's the full uh, key name. Now it's telling me that it's a hash. So let me inspect uh, knowing that it's a hash. H get all event colon and then the key. Okay, so this is an actual event that's going on within our Olympic Games. Um, it's the venue is at the Fukushima Azuma Baseball Stadium. Um, the price is 25. Now you see here, the metal event is false. So this is not a metal event. Um, so all of these are just going to be all the events that aren't metal events. And when you, when you touched upon uh, multiple sets having the same member, and when you intersect them, and there's still just one um, unique member between the two, that's actually really important. Because you'll notice up here, um, where is it? Metal event, disabled access, true. So now let's look up. I think we also have uh, S scan, FS disabled access, colon, true. So let's remember this ID ending in TPQH. Let's scan this. This is a different set. And there we go. 
we have the exact same events. So we have one set that has disabled access true that has this key. We have another set, metal event. Uh, I looked up metal event false that has this key. So now what happens when we intersect those two sets? Let's use the center, which is set intersect. And we'll have SF, or I'm sorry, <laughs> FS uh, metal event false, and then FS disabled access true. So this is going to look between those two sets, and it's actually going to give us an intersection of the two. So I want to find an event that's non metal, low stakes, but is uh, disabled access set the true. And so we actually have quite a few. So now all these events actually meet um, my requirements. Now we can add yet another one. Um, let's check out uh, venues. This is uh, one of our, all, our big set of venues. And so here's a big list of all of the other ones, uh, all the ones that we have. And so let's say, um, it's not on here, but I want to look up uh, the Nippon Budokan. So let me inspect that real quick. That's one of our venues, FS venue Nippon Budokan. Notice that I have a space right here. So I actually have to wrap this up in double quotes. Cool. So here are the here's our Nippon Budokan set. This is going to give us uh, these two uh events. So there's only two events going on there. So I want to see if we have anything going on in the Nippon Budokan that is not a metal event, is uh, does give us disabled access. So FS, I'm just going to add this on to our intersection. So FS venue, actually, I'm going to write this in double quotes, FS colon venue colon Nippon Okay, so we intersected all three of those sets, and of, out of all three, there's only one um, event that actually came through. So that's pretty interesting. If you remember, we uh, when we did the two previous intersections, we had quite a few. So this one it was just narrowed down down to this single uh, event up here so let's actually inspect this event so i remember this is uh, a hash so h get all for getting all of the elements of the hash and then i'll call event colon and then our unique skew and there we go so let me just look at this just to verify i mean i trust redis but i just want to look at it so disabled access is set to true. The venue is Nippon Budokan. And the metal event is false. So there we go. So imagine each set being a filter of some sort. Um, in the e-commerce uh, example, if I'm looking for shoes, we would have a set of red shoes, a set of shoes that are size 13 and a half, and a set of Velcro shoes. And if I wanted to find my magic, my magic pair of shoes that I want that are red, 13 and a half and Velcro, we would intersect all three of those sets. And hopefully I'd have a couple to choose from. Probably not, but it, it's, you know, it's worth a try. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is faceted search. And uh, Alvin goes through it in much more detail um, within the videos. And so this is a supplement. I highly recommend that you, of course, watch the videos. Um, but faceted search is basically intersecting sets of members that have all the same field attribute. So if I'm looking for disabled access true, all the hashes or all the, the members within that set are going to have disabled access true. I'm also going to keep a set of disabled access false. And all the members in that set are going to have their attribute disabled access set the false. Now, this is 
a pretty big stretch from what we have been doing with playing of sets. Um, it's really using sets to store attributes of hashes. So it is OK to have more than one member in different sets. So um, Nippon Budokan, the event for Nippon Budokan, in, in our case, um, this one right here, we know that it exists within three different sets. And that's OK. Like we, we can do that. That's how faceted searches work. So you don't have to be worried about only having one instance um, of this you know, skew here, of this random, of this unique ID in only one place. So you can use sets a lot in your search capabilities. Um, Simon, or not Simon, uh, Alvin, sorry, I was watching the JavaScript course earlier. The uh, Alvin talks about object inspection when you're going through and looking for uh, some of these search capabilities. And that's really, really slow because you have to iterate through all the objects. And it's just an anti-pattern when it comes to Redis. Redis loves um, faceted search. But also, since this um, course has been made and since we've been doing faceted search, there's also a Redis, well, there's a couple of Redis modules that we would recommend. There's Redis search with Redis JSON. So you can actually use Redis search to query uh, your Redis data store and find um, different events with different search parameters. Um, it's not SQL. It's the, the query language is, is, is within Redis, but it's very easy to read and understand. And it actually, we have another course that you should actually check out. We might actually do this after this course. Maybe Susan and I will explore that course. Um, but it's really great. Andrew created it. I helped out with a couple of videos. And um, it's a lot easier to set up and run, I would say, than doing a faceted search. It's important to know about faceted search because it definitely works. Um, you can use Redis search as an extra Redis module that just integrates search capabilities like this. Plus, when you use Redis JSON, it's just beautiful because everybody loves JSON. And it kind of replaces a hash, if you will. So OK. Enough of that stumping. Um, faceted search. Does that? How does that sit with you? It sits a lot better than what, when I watch the videos. So no offense to Alvin, but it's just uh, it's just different, isn't it? Sometimes you need to hear it in a different way. Yeah. So I, some people will watch Alvin's video and get it the first time. I did not, and I'm really grateful that you went through it in your own way. There, even though you use the same example, you just explain it in a in a different way, and it it kind of sticks a bit now. But yeah, very interesting that we kind of bang on about how sets um contain unique values and things like that but i think really the uniqueness here is the combination isn't it yeah that you're forming when you do search so yeah like you say there you can have things appearing in more than one place but that is natural because what you're comparing is the attributes um not the actual keys yeah so yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely um, one more example that I really like to do. Um, this this I, this always gets me warmed up for faceted search. Uh, when I make a stack, I'll do let's do um, odds, and I'll just create a, a set of one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty-one, twenty-three. Okay, and then I'll do um, another set of over 10. So I'll do 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. I think I see where you're going with this. Yep. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a lot easier. And this is what I actually had to do um, to really kind of cement faceted search within my brain before I took on the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, don't go don't go and play in the Olympics before you've understood it. Yeah, yeah, you have to train. <laughs> yeah, um, and then I'm gonna need your help with this one primes. So, oh lord, uh, one, two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty-three. I think so. 
<laughs> I don't know. We're going back to school now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's pretty good. Um, yeah, let's just call that prime. prime oh, prime. two isn't a prime, is it? Oh, no, yeah, no, no two is a prime. Yeah, two is oh, a prime. God, I'm getting confused. Yeah. Okay, so now we have three sets. Odds, <laughs> over 10, and primes. Fibonacci, Fibonacci. No, okay, oh. no, I'm joking. <laughs> But that escalates really fast anyway, so there'd yeah, only be yeah. like three things in there. <laughs> we could do that. We could do that. Um, so let's call uh, S inter on, let's do one that's odds and over 10. So this is going to give us the intersection of these two. So I'm predicting it's going to be 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, and 23. Uh, and then none of the evens up here. So let's check that out. There we go. So when combining these two and finding um, what they have in common, this just gives us the top odds, if you will. And then let's do uh, S inter uh, odds and primes. Now this is going to give us basically all odds. I mean, um, all the it's primes. Skip, yeah, all the primes was just going to skip two, uh, just you know the way that these two sets are. So now let's say I'm searching for um, all odd numbers that are over ten and are primes, and so now I'm intersecting all three of these, and now I get 11, 13, 17, 19, and twenty-three. So. This has taken all three sets, intersected them, and given to them to me. And imagine me just searching. I'm, I'm searching numbers, searching through these values. Um, and this just isn't as big as the Olympics example, but it really just gets my brain going. Yeah, yeah, because numbers are something that most of us know about, and most of us know the order uh, which we would expect to see them. And most of us are familiar with odds and evens and primes. So you know what you expect the result to be yeah. whereas when you're using an unfamiliar data set you have to do that extra step of thinking like was this actually what i expected to see because i have no idea what facilities this venue has um at all so yeah no i like that cool. i like that yeah yeah use something you know it's like when we create hello world for our first example um this is sort of like a hello world for for set intersection that i like to use question yeah so does Redis look inside the sets in the order in which you type them. So will it look in odds first and then and then look in over 10 and then compare and then look in primes and then compare to the, the first two? Oh, so when creating a set, does it look at it in the order that you placed it? Yeah, so you have you've created your three sets though, primes, odds, primes, odds over tens and primes. Yeah. And then you're looking for the intersection between all three of those things. Will it and you've typed them in a certain order. Right. So right. is it looking in and we might touch on this in big O actually, because some of it relates to the the one with the lowest cardinality. But um what order does it look so does it look at in the first set that you've typed into your inter command and then compare it with the second set that you've typed into the inter and then look at the third one and compare that with the first two yeah or, that's a very good question or does it look for the smallest one i don't know just a random you might not know the answer but yeah, yeah no, no. that's a that's a really great question and that's a great segue into our performance and big o talk um, yeah, it does look at the first one first. So the way that you actually list in the intersections, it does matter. Um, and I've been pretty fast and loose with my um, my the, which which sets that I use because we're in a learning environment. But it actually does matter performance-wise uh, if you use a smaller set first. Um, so we'll actually talk about that. Um, yeah, that was not a deliberate segue. I genuinely oh, no, no, was great. thinking, uh, like, okay, how does it actually compare? Because I did go to a talk on Big O Notation once, and they talked mm -hmm. about the different ways you could compare, and you know, like traversing the whole set or splitting it in half or whatever, and things right. like that. So yeah, it just suddenly occurred to me that the order that you type things in might make a difference. Yeah, and um, it, talking on our um, our Olympics example, 
um, using the smaller sets of like disabled access true or disabled access false, um, or just using the venue first uh, with a small amount of events, that actually dictates your, your performance a lot. Um, so we'll, we'll revisit one of the intersections within our Olympics example and see how it could be increased in performance. Um, but let's, yeah, let's, let's hop over to uh, big O. So yeah. um, there's a ton of theory and there are books and papers and careers created over uh, big O notation and performance. I took a whole class in big O and sometimes I wake up with nightmares. Sometimes I wake up with pleasant <laughs> dreams of memories. Um, basically, it gives you um, a performance metric or a, a time complexity of how long in CPU um, time it would take to actually perform a task. Now, sometimes you'll think, oh, you're, are you thinking like wall time or like actual time it takes like in like seconds or milliseconds? That's not actually the case. It's not worried about seconds because we can't guarantee that my laptop will perform the same operation as your laptop or somebody else's desktop or some Linux cloud instance in you know, uh, some, you know, some other cloud provider, um, we can't actually think about time. We can think about time complexity. So how much uh, CPU time would it take for to complete a task? Now, a lot of uh, functions or a lot of uh, commands that Redis does um, they want to do it as fast as possible, absolutely fast as possible. That's what Redis eats for breakfast, speed and efficiency. So a lot of times you'll see uh, the notation of, uh, actually, let me get rid of this. Ah, much better. I was feeling a little crowded. Um, the notation of O of 1, that's, that's our favorite one. We're always looking for O of 1. That means that it takes one. Um, it's constant time complexity. It just takes an instant, one single unit of CPU time uh, to actually complete a task. And all the time, it will take a constant time amount. So um, for example, Redis always keeps a pointer to the absolute left or absolute right of a list data type. So at any given point, it will always know exactly where to look for the first element or the last element of a list. So it will take one unit of CPU time. Um, now, on my laptop, if I run that command, it's O of 1. On your laptop, it will also be O of 1. So it's always it's the same unit of, of measurement. It's not exactly time. It's the, the complexity of actually accessing that data. So O of 1, in a lot of my videos, I always say, it's constant time complexity, and that's as efficient as it gets because it is. We, oh, it's like basically knowing exactly where to find, um, you know, your favorite pair of shoes or your your favorite, you know, cereal bowl or your favorite hat. You know exactly where it is, so you don't have to waste time searching for it. Um, you know, if I go into my fridge now and I have to find the fancy mustard, I have to search for it. But I always know where my coffee is because I use it all the time. So. Um, sometimes it can take more time than constant time, and that's when we call it O of N. So um, now let me just hop back on. Oop. So O of 1 is constant time. So let's do, uh, let's create just a simple list. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, if I want to get... Um, your L push seven. This is, let me actually embiggen a little bit. You'll see here <laughs> this O of one. You'll, because it always know knows where the left most point of the list is. So when I add this to, um, sorry, where was my, oh. Oh, did I just call my list zero? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me just do that. I'm, oh, like, I'm sure uh, loads of people have got databases <laughs> with list equals zero online. That's funny. All right, let's go on my list. Zero, one, <laughs> two, three, four, five, and six. Wow. Wow. Redis just gives you, you know, plenty of... Redis just does what he tells you, do what you tell it to. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Not at all. No. So um, <laughs> let me do L push seven 
on my list. Um, and it knows exactly where the end of my list is. So that was super fast. That was constant time. So things that are not constant time, we consider oh, N. N is a number. Uh, it can be sometimes thought as the worst case scenario of how long in um, CPU time it would take to find something. So let's say I want to go through the entire list. I want to call L range. L range, it's S of N, but if I go through all of it, um, it's going to be L of N. So let's do L range, my list, zero through negative one. So what it's going to do, it's going to return all of the elements. It's going to start at the beginning of my list, <clears throat> And it's going to go through. So if I just ret retrieved O of one with seven, if I just did L, uh, R pop my list, this is O of one because it knows exactly where the rightmost point of my list is. But if I go through my list and I retrieve zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, and seven, it's iterating through all of those. And so it's no longer one, it's N. N in this case being um seven question yeah um so say you've got seven items in your list and you wanted to get rid of the rightmost item so you could either say you're going to pop from the right or you could pop from the seventh from the left or the sixth from the like zero to six couldn't you um so do those have a different are they differently expensive or or uh, do, do different uh, amount of cost because you're counting through to the seventh, whereas if you pop from the right, you're just looking at the rightmost one and popping it off. Yeah, absolutely. You, since Redis maintains pointers um, on the right and left part of the list, you want to use those as often as possible. Having it count from one section all the way to the other side is, is actually running uh, an O of N performance, and that's actually really, really not what we want. So very good question. So instead of doing like an L trim, um, which starts at the zero index, and we say if we want to use L trim to re remove the end uh, of the list, we, that would take O of N. And we have a small list here going from seven to zero numerically, but if you're having a list of like a million, you know, which is not unheard of in Redis because there's a lot of massive data types, we store a lot of information, iterating through that. It's going to take time and um like we're having fun of small lists but sometimes you know um the iterations can get like gonzo fast like uh gonzo slow i mean like uh we're used to just having it in within the cli but we have sub millisecond transactions that we actually expect when we're running you know full app production applications here we're just sort of playing in the cli um yeah. so th that actually really matters um and it takes time and it, you have to think about the performance of a lot of the different functions that you're calling when you're grouping them together or what, what kind of data you expect to get and what your actions are going to be. You want to pick the right commands that suits your needs that gives you the highest efficiency and the speed. Yeah, so this, this really brings me to mind of like, you know, when folks that are new to coding and they're like, you know, how am I going to know how to do all this stuff? And, yeah. you know, we always try to reassure them that you don't need to know everything, but you just need to think about what you're doing in a logical way and then go away and find out what you need to tell the computer to do to achieve what you want to do. But at the end of the day, it all comes back down to thinking about things in an organized way. And like I say, knowing your data. So if, you, if you've got a massive data set, you want to be able to know vaguely what's in there or what it consists of so that you know the best way to actually interrogate that data so you're not wasting a huge amount of efficiency. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, with our with our object inspection versus faceted search with the Olympics, uh, Alvin talks about how it's just really inefficient to do an object inspection while iterating through all the objects as opposed to doing set intersection um, as a faceted search. That's a really great example. Um, so with like a list with with L range, and I kind of jumped over this because I wanted to show you the worst case scenario, but L range usually you don't want to use to get the entire 
list. We're just doing this to just visually inspect it. But with with L range, it's um, we're taking uh, O of N and we're adding on to that. So now it's O of S plus N. So S is the offset where you start. So I'm using L range my list zero negative one. So if I want to do L range my list, let's say uh, two through six, that's going to give me a portion of um, my list. So S is going to be the offset. I'm going to have to travel before I start sending back my list. And then N is going to be the quantity between my offset and the end. So N in this case would be one, two, three, four, five. So that's just another thing to consider. Uh, L range, it's, it, it's still O of N, but it gives you even more because you actually have to travel first before you even return it. So that traveling through the list to find the first uh, uh, element to return, that actually counts. So that's actually going to you know, cost you performance. And the, the, the way that I feel more and more comfortable, and this is actually really helpful for me, is just talking about big O with somebody, just doing like a, a bit of like, does this smell weird? Like, does this make sense to you? Because when you're swimming through big O and big performance considerations, sometimes you just get a little cloudy and it's best to work with others, of course, with this. Now, I want to talk about the S inter, uh, set intersection. That's a really, really interesting one. And that actually can get really big um, or it can stay really, really fast, depending on how you structure your set inter uh, intersection commands. So let me go up really far into our history and see if I can find. OK, I think this is a. So this is a three. Uh, set intersection. Um, and let's see here. Let's check out um, FS venue. This is the big one. So this will be our last big hurdle. Ooh. Oh, I need the cursor. OK, so there's two members within this set. So now let's look up. Uh, the cardinality. Actually, you know what? Look at me, not using what I should. Let's look at the cardinality of disabled access true. So it's 31. Now let's look up uh, the cardinality of metal events as false. 28. And then just so we have a perfect complete list, FS venue. Then you Nippon Budokan. OK, two. So we have one set that's two cardinality, one set that's 28, and one set that's 31. So with S enter, the big O is uh, N times M. I think it's N times N. Yeah. So that's actually one that you have to be a little you know, more thoughtful of. This is what it looks like. Now, N represents the cardinality of the first set in your command. M is the quantity of sets that you're running in your command. So in our case, um, let's take this command up here. My first set is metal event false. Metal event false has 28. So this would be 28. And then M is the quantity of sets we have in our command, which is three. So that's three. Uh, 28 times three is 84. So our performance is technically 84. Um, and that's CPU you know, time. Now, if you notice, if we actually call, and we'll go over the numbers first and the actual reasoning behind this afterwards. But if we use the Nippon Budokan first, that has two as the cardinality, and then we use three as the quantity of sets, well, that's six. Six versus 84. I mean, there's no, there's no competing with that. But why is that? Why, why is that so much better? 
two elements exist in the Nippon Budokan. So when we're intersecting Nippon Budokan with, say, disabled access, there's only two elements that are going to go and intersect through a disabled access. We're not going to have 31 elements, say, if we're doing disabled access first, going through Nippon Budokan to check if they match. So it it does matter a lot um, the quantity of the first, the cardinality of the first set, because that first set is going to traverse through each other set and look, hey, do any of the members within me exist within you? Well, if you're only looking for two, that's so much faster if you're looking for 31. So um, this one is a pretty big difference as far as consideration for performance. With O of N, you're pretty comfortable understanding what kind of a hit you're taking. With O1, you really don't have to worry about it at all. With um, S inter, um, with set intersections, you do have to do a little bit of consideration as far as what's the smallest set starting. So you could do this by programmatically by finding the cardinality of each of the sets, um, or you could store, you know, just like a table of the cardinality of each set and look up that table, which you know, which uh, set should I use first when running my faceted search? Um, so some things to think about. But also, there's Redis search. <laughs> so which kind of, you know, takes away a lot of this worry because Redis search is extremely fast. It does use secondary indexing with its full text and querying. So it's, it's like a different, different beast, basically. So um, that's kind of a touch on performance. Um, it's, it, it, it's, you'll want to actually go through, of course, like Alvin does a really, really great deep dive on performance and big O notation. And again, this is just, you know, adding some, some, some sugar sprinkles to his porridge, basically of education. Um, but you'll want to actually go through again. And I watched it multiple times. I watched it last night just so I'd make sure that I'm fresh, you know, to talk about it. Um, but yeah, uh, big O performance is, uh, constant topic of conversation. And it's, I, you know, I find it's best to just go to different sources and read up on it and get everybody's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a definite thing. You know, it's, it's, a, um, it's a finite world of like, this is actually O of N, or this is actually O of 1, or log N, or N squared, which is really bad. But it's just really good to like, hear it through different voices. Because it, it, you know, a lot of people just sort of focus on different aspects of performance um yeah cool. and they use different examples as well don't they yeah and a lot of people know that unfortunately they're going to get tested on this if they go for a job interview as a software engineer and if you've only ever been taught it in a dry way with just the letters then it's probably not going to make as much sense as if you had some examples and just try and consume as many different examples as you can yeah. Until you find one that actually sticks with you, and then you can you can confidently uh, sort of explain that to somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great recommendation. Like learning, because yeah, you can learn it one way, and uh, during an interview, it might not kind of resonate with what you remember learning. So having different voices, you know, uh, just really adds to the quality of your education on on Big O, um, and you know. Inevitably, there is a, a, a interview question about big O notation, which is, you know, the interviewer doesn't exactly have super <laughs> high excitement on asking it, but sometimes you just have to go through it, you know. So, um, and the, the just the the touch on a little bit more um, the gist that we have of all of the, the cheat codes basically that I've been putting in. It has another example um, of of three sets that intersect, and you can actually see. Uh, you know, a small set iterating through a bigger set and another even bigger set. And you'll see the performance of speed. Um, and you can actually, you know, you could run a program that iterates through, you know, three different sets or, or, or arrays and not have it like, you know, read out to the console, um, you know, when it's actually doing work. And you can actually verify this. So, you know, you have to take our word for it. Um, so, yeah, just a little performance considerations. Um, and again, all the, the Redis commands you'll see all have, you know, uh, 
can I look up geo radius? There we go. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't worry. This is going to be super fun. But we'll see some pretty wacky, um, uh, you know, big O's of O of n plus log m. What? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. That's it's it's you know it's good. Um, so all of these different commands we'll find. You know, what about uh, Stralgo? Oh, we don't. Oh, we don't actually have Strago in this one. Is that you want to go to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> PR pop L push. One of my favorite ones. It's a big command, but it's only of one. So there's nothing to worry about. We'll always know the, the performance of different commands. Um, you have to see. Oh, thanks, guy. Yeah. So Strago is Reda 62. Uh, this is actually 609 um, version numbers. So we'll always see the command performance uh, in our Redis Insight, but also our Redis command uh, website in Redis IO. So don't ever worry about not knowing what a command is. And when you combine these, then you actually can, you know, have a good idea of like how to best structure your code for the most performant um, applications. And that's, you know, why we use Redis. We're not using Redis because it's nice and slow. It's because it's nice and fast and efficient. So that's my speech on big O. <laughs> 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 always, always welcome. Like I said, always good to hear a different, different way of explaining it. But uh, yeah, you you could do a whole week of lectures about Big O and still not touch everything. Yeah, absolutely. And there's commands that you know we would prefer within Redis. So um, you know, like we can use for sets like S members, uh, which will give you all of the members of you know the set. But if you want to just do a portion, I've even seen me use a scan. That gives me a portion of uh, a larger group of sets. So it's actually faster. And I just do that by default because S members is one of those quote unquote dangerous commands that could actually retrieve a lot of elements and take a lot of time. Like keys is a dangerous command. H get all is potentially a dangerous command we can use it because we're having fun in a course but if we're like you know getting a million elements of a hash h get all is gonna be super slow so we, that's why we actually say h, use h get you know exactly what you're using so just another example yep know your data <laughs> <laughs> so um homework did you have a couple uh homework questions or um well i did a couple i'm going to go back to a couple the 2.8 is just like i have no idea where to start shall i share my screen yeah yeah it's like really mathsy though so i don't know whether it's uh let's see yeah I have to do some maths. I've used zero of two attempts, so uh, let's see. Sounds good. All right. So, oh, this is this is a fun one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this actually this actually works out. This sort of touches on um, when we are talking about big O of sets. So, uh, three attributes have the described value distribution. Oof. Okay. Um, a set A has a cardinality of twenty thousand. And values are 20% true, 80% false. OK, so we will have to do a little bit of math here. That means 20% of a 20% of 20,000 is true. 80% of 20,000 is false. Um, the breakdown of attribute B, cardinality of 10,000, 45% uh, is male, 45% is female, and then NA is 10%. OK. And so those are going to be all portions of 10,000. And then uh, for attribute C, cardinality is 15,000. And uh, just these, these random A is 20%, B is 20%, C is 20%, D is 20%. Okay, so these are all broken down by 20% each. The time complexity for S enter is defined as N times M. And again, N, N for Nancy, is the cardinality of the first set in the command, and M is a quantity of all sets. So if a set is created for each attribute and value combination, what is the time complexity for S enter for A equals false, B equals female, C equals E? 
Okay, so we'll want to intersect A is false, B is female, C is E. Um, so cardinality, we want to, since N times M, cardinality times mul uh, the total number of sets, we know that M is going to be three. So that doesn't really, <laughs> that doesn't really uh, remove any of the answers from here. But we also want to find the, the set um, N to start off with, with the lowest cardinality. So the lowest cardinality, let's do, say, let's imagine A false. So 80% of 20,000 uh, is 16,000. So that would be the cardinality that we'd be looking for. There would be a set somewhere that exists uh, of nothing but false um, for attribute A. So let's remember 16,000. Hopefully we can beat 16,000. It's not even in our answers. So uh, let's look at the distribution of, um, let's see here. B is set to female. So what's 45% of 10,000? That's 4,500. OK, that's better. Um, can we do better than 4,500, which would be the cardinality of one of the sets we're using? Let's look up C equals E. So uh, I, don't, I don't know, that sort of reads weird to me, but attribute C with the distribution of E 20%, let's do 20% of 15,000, yeah. So we have 3,000. So that's the smallest one amongst all three of those. A is false, B is female, C is E. And it's the only oh. one in the answers. Yeah, so Process 3, of elimination. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really good to go through this and so you have an absolute idea of like, you know, what you'd want to use first. So if we used set C first, we would only have to iterate through 3,000 members in the other two sets, which sounds like a lot, but what was it? 3,000 versus like if we used 16,000? 16, 16, yeah. Right. So that's, that's a huge, huge speed up in performance. And that's just us doing our math and going through and figuring out which one has, has the best speed. So let's go, I would recommend doing N equals 3,000 and M equals three. I'll take full responsibility if it's wrong. That's cool, I've got two attempts, so we're, we're good. <laughs> nice, all right. Yeah. Let's look at show answer just to see what was said. Ah, so there yep. we go. Maths. Okay, cool. <laughs> we all our maths were correct. Right. Nice. So yeah. And yeah, I know I, I know this this example within our homework. It's a uh, it's a little more mathy and numerical as compared to the other ones. But it's always good to go through. Uh, you know, get your pen and paper and just do you know bang out all these these uh these problems. But it it just reminds you again. You want to find the smallest cardinality set in the beginning. Yeah, sorry about that one. That was a bit of an evil one to pull out, but I, oh, no, I looked but... at that and I'm like, how the heck do I do this question? <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's good. I've seen Jason, uh, Justin later this week, so I'll just ask him. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. Cool. Okay, so let's go through the ones that I actually did uh, manage. Well, like, let's start with the first one because I know how to do that, but I left it for the stream. So okay. uh, given the following command, sad, set three A, capital A, uh, lowercase b, capital C, sad set four, lowercase a, b, and uppercase c. Okay. What does the following command output? So okay. um, we're looking at these two sets and we want to get the difference between set three and set four. So we want to find the, um, the thing that doesn't, that isn't common to both. Right. And this command, actually, in particular, returns um, members of the set from the first set that you, you list in the command. So it's looking for the difference of what um, set three has that set four doesn't. And it's only going to return what set three has that set four doesn't. Yeah. So the answer would be different if you said s diff set four and then set three absolutely yeah so uh yeah placement counts as far as uh, s diff goes 
um, as far as pure value. Interesting. So I'm then going to say, right, we're looking at set three first, and then we're looking at set four and comparing. Um, they're both the same apart from the capital A and set three. So I'm going to say capital A. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great answer. Cool. Yeah. cool, cool. I'm always a bit worried when it's slow to <laughs> I pop up. I'm like, oh, <laughs> did I get it wrong? So, um, yes. Yeah, so this is what we said. If you perform the S diff with the sets reversed, you would get the, the lowercase a um, as the correct answer. Cool. Yeah. yeah. S diff is a little nuanced. You always have to remember which one's first. Um, but yeah, this is a great question just because it, it you know kind of forces you to, to envision. You can, of course, put this in your Redis Insight command line just to verify it. But um, it's always good to sort of you know suss it out logically before entering it in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I do try and think about them first before I type them in. So, uh, yeah, let's do this one, though, because I have already done this. Um, but, yeah, this one was quite interesting. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't necessarily remember the commands, but because they're written in quite an Englishy way, you can kind of figure it out. And I thought, how many attempts have I got? I've got two attempts. So... I thought, yeah, let's let's try it in a logical way first and see if that works. So if the following commands are executed, I'll push list one A, B, C, D, right? So you're you're declaring list one by our pushing to it because it didn't already exist. Yes. And they're going um, back. Yes. Then you are oh, so if you are push, what order? Would list one come out as if you? Hmm. Yeah. What so order would those items come out as? So when you L push, you push the elements from the left. Well, actually, sorry, my screen is reversed, so my, my fingers are not helpful. <laughs> um, so when you L push, you push the elements into the left. So we first input A, and then we input B and then C and D all from the left. So your list would read as D, C, B, A. So it's not exactly in alphabetical order like you would imagine, like it is seen here. But if you use R push, we're, we're pushing from the end of the list, then A, B, C, D will preserve the alphabetical order in this case. Right. Yeah. So... I I did not pick up on that nuance when I read the question, so I was actually quite lucky. <laughs> um, but I think actually it was probably just a kind question because if you put L push, that would have been quite evil, wouldn't it? People, I think, would, including yeah. me, would have fallen into the hole. So what I find quite useful is if you write this stuff out. So you've got A, B, C, and D, and then you're inserting this. And this is something we didn't have in the video. We didn't have after. Right. So I was kind of thinking, does this exist or is it just like some sort of trick question and they put in a command that doesn't exist? But now I've done two weeks of this. I don't think that's that's your style, is it? You're not going to give me a, a trick question. We try so not. list one, yeah, list one after C, X, Y, Z. So now it looks like A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and then D. Yep, that sounds good. And then we're going to L trim list one one and three so l trim is when you're keeping the pieces within the trim that you're specifying which is a little bit backwards to what you might think it is because you think you're going to trim off the bits that you're specifying but you're actually trimming the things that are around it so right. that is something actually that i did remember the first time i watched the video i was like oh okay that's not the way around i would have thought it was so l trim list one one three so to me, that means, if I'm remembering rightly, you're going one in from the left, but it's zero and one. Mm -hmm. So A is zero, B is one. So you're left with C, X, Y, Z, and D. And then you're going in three from the left, from the right. No. Three from the left, you're good. Right, OK. Zero, one, two, three. So you're left with A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. So you're just getting rid of the D. Um, 
with L trim, so we're skipping zero. So zero is going to be removed. Oh, yes. One through three is going to be preserved. And then so anything after three is going to be removed. Right. So, so you uh, have to B, C, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yeah, the insertions and trims are always a little different from programming languages and, and databases. Like, don't even get me started with like, Python versus JavaScript with trim. Uh, um, but database uh, with Redis, you know, they had to make a decision with some sort of, you know, scheme with trim. So this is the one that they kept. And, you know, again, usage over and over and over and over. You just sort of like grok how it feels. You just know how it feels and it becomes like an appendage. So, yeah, L trim just keeps what is dictated within those numbers inclusively. So it keeps the one index and it keeps the three index and anything on the outside, it removes. It's, it's gone, yeah. yeah. So L range on the other hand, takes away, removes the things, I think, that you're specifying. L so, range, actually it, it goes through. So this just shows you all the elements oh it lists them all out yes yeah. Yeah. okay right so we want to list everything from the zeroth which is the leftmost to the negative one which is the rightmost right. which is everything there you go so we're left with b c x y z yeah and we use negative one when we don't exactly know the length the specific length negative one just basically tells it go all the way to the end and wrap around <laughs> kind of um and so that will ensure that we get the entire uh list in this case with l range that's a good way of remembering it actually if you just remember that zero and negative one means the whole lot then you don't even have to think about counting to you yeah exactly <laughs> like i did because i'm a bit of an amateur so i was like right okay zero and that's the first one minus one but yeah once you get used as well like to the fact that minus one is the rightmost one that does help you a lot yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to pick one for the next one? I have done. Sure. What let's, numbers that? let's take a look at the ones that you haven't done yet. Let's look at number three. Cool. Okay. Let's Ooh. see. Okay. Zrem range by rank. Oh, okay. that's a good one. <laughs> oh, <Okay. laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know. You help write these questions, so it's on you. <laughs> so, uh, okay. If the, if the following commands are executed, Zad, HW, and you have to kind of not be swayed by what they're naming the thing in the first place, because that is a total red herring as well. Like it says two yeah. to three, but that means nothing. Yeah. Um, right. So this is a sorted set because it's Z. Mm -hmm. And we've got the members are the letters, aren't they? And the, the members scores are the. Are the and the scores are the numbers. Right, so we've got six members and six scores. And then we're gonna say Zerem range by rank two minus one. Right, so Zerem range by rank is your removing a range by rank. And the rank is from the smallest to the highest because Rev would be the highest to the low, the biggest to the smallest. Yes. Right. Uh, they don't actually have that command, Z, Rev, Rem range, fortunately, because that's just too much. <laughs> so um, also with this with this sorted set, um, they did us a kindness because it is in order. So you can imagine the set looking like A, B, C, D, E, F in the actual sorted set. And those, those values, of course, go from lowest score to highest score. So we can look at that with confidence if we're traversing it and removing at different different locations. So that's, yeah. that's helpful. And like you say, if it wasn't in that order, you could quite easily copy and paste that into yeah. Redis Insight and in, in your little sandpit and have a look. Absolutely. Right, so we're, we're saying we're gonna remove a range by rank of those things that are three in from the left because it's two, so it's zero, zero th, one, and tooth. Mm -hmm. all the way to the very end. So we're removing one, two. 
hmm, inclusive. So you're removing the tooth all the way to the end. Yep. Right. So you're left with 0A and 1B. Absolutely. That's what I would say. Right. Yeah, so the cardinality is two. Yeah. Yeah. The, the negative one, of course, goes all the way to the end. And this is inclusive removal. So uh, two, uh, the rank two, which is B. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. not. Uh, I'm reading it wrong. C would go away. So C, D, E, and F would go away. Yeah, it's a good thing that the multiple choice isn't labeled A, 0, B, 2. <laughs> See, like, there's too many letters and numbers in this thing. I'm getting confused. Right, so the cardinality is 2. Yep. Let's see. Nice. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, these are these are fun ones just because you really have to sort of like, of course you could do them in the Redis CLI, but it's, I think it's a little bit more fun and enriching if you just kind of talk it out you know tell a story um do you have a um do you have like a little object on your desk that you sometimes just talk to like a rubber ducky i got a teddy there you go you talk to your teddy I, I, everybody <laughs> has to have a small inanimate object or a coworker or a pet. inanimate he's got a personality he's a person <laughs> my rubber ducky is inanimate you can yeah of course teddy's valid um but yeah, it, it always helps just to talk it out, you know, talk out what you're going through. And nine times out of the 10, you'd be like, oh, I didn't even think about that. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you, Rubber Ducky. <laughs> yeah, it's um, definitely uh, easier to talk it out. Yeah, but no, yeah. That's, a, that's, a great, yeah. that's a great example. Yeah, that is a great example because I was very much like, yeah, I think it's the uh, the lowest to the highest there. And I'm kind of looking at you and like, <laughs> trying to get the body <laughs> language. So uh yeah, cool. Did you want to do another one? Uh, sure. Let's do one more. Okay, which one do you want to do? Uh, let's do. Let's hear one, two, three. Let's do the fifth one. Or oh, the fourth one if you can from zero. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. In the fastest search chapter, we explored how to optimize searches based on categories. How many venues have disabled access equals true? Okay, cool. Mm, so we need to go in the sand pit for this one, don't we? Yeah, so we're going to have to um, remember our commands and which one works best to give us uh, the quantity of venues that have disabled access true. So yeah, let's, let's see if I can share all of the screen. Um, so that I've got my sand pit next to it. Yeah, that's a, a great point. This is the data that's been loaded into our Redis within the first week. So if you don't have that, refer to the uh, setup instructions that are in week one, or uh, check out our video, and you can watch us actually input it from the Redis cloud. Yes. So um, yeah, definitely check out the first video because we went through all of that stuff. Of like, we didn't go through it in real time. So I had downloaded some of the stuff, but Justin gave a really good explanation following the step by step guide of how to get all of this stuff on your machine and how to connect them up as well. So, right, I'm going to try sharing screen two. Please tell me if that works. It looks right to me. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you should be able to see the question on the right and Redis Insight on the left. So all of the data is already in Redis Insight because we're using the training data. If we just simply copy and paste this in, I wonder what's going to happen. Well, we'll want to use some command. Um, we can do a couple of different commands uh, to inspect it and look at it. Um, I know S scan. Uh, we'll we'll take a look at it and it'll allow you to iterate through all of it and it will give you the quantity but that's a bit of a big command to just get the quantity there is a command that we can use um to actually get the cardinality of uh just the set and just returns an integer do you do you remember that one by chance s card s guard yeah scarred Scarred. Scarred. <laughs> the pirate one. Pirate come out. Right. right. So if I now copy if I now paste this thing, let's do this again because uh 
I'm a little bit worried in case it didn't actually copy that and then it pasted something else that I previously copied. <laughs> Fair enough. Because you never know. It could be a URL <laughs> to some website that is really boring that you really don't want to see. So uh, how about if we do this? All right. So yeah, the the the, uh, the little hints give you the exact same information. So S card with the key, and that looks pretty good. Cool. I'm glad you said that because I would have just totally just copied that in without a command. Schoolgirl error. Cool. Nice. Thirty one. Yeah. So that returns just the integer thirty one, which is a cardinality. Um, and we ran a scan on it. We could count individually, but Let's just let Redis do it for us. Exactly. And also, if you've been playing with this sandbox and you happen to uh, add in something else into this, you may have char changed the cardinality. I mean, it's unlikely, but you may well have changed it if you were really going deep and, uh, and having a good play with this data. So yeah, just remember, if you don't get an answer, that's on the list. <laughs> Just think back, like, did I actually add or take away anything from this data? Yeah, maybe. That might be the reason. It is unlikely, though. So luckily, 31 does appear in the list. So I'm going to just take a punt on 31. Sounds good. I support you. <laughs> nice. Thanks for your unwavering support. <laughs> there cool. we go. S card. Yeah. I appreciated the hint there. I remembered S card. I just didn't remember that you needed to put a command at the beginning. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, we just uh, repetition, repetition, and then you do it again. And uh, it's just, you know, memorization after that. Um, there's actually something really cool. Um, I know we've been using the CLI a lot. And I think that we would actually benefit if we used um, the browser tab in our Redis Insight. Okay. And we can just kind of use this really sweet tool that uh, you know the developers at Redis have given us. So in the uh, search field under keys, it's giving us the asterisk, which is literally running the command keys star. So it's giving us just a huge list of all the keys in our Redis. Let's actually, instead of using that asterisk, let's paste in that FS disabled access true. And that's going to run a search for that key. We can browse it. So do I press enter then? Yeah. OK. So now I found it. And let's go ahead and click on that. Oh. Cool. So now on the right here, we can see um, our data structure, FS disabled access true. And we get a lot of information out of it. Uh, we can first, on the way up there, uh, right below FS disabled, we can see that it is a data type set and it has a cardinality of 31. Incidentally. The size is two kilobytes, and it has no expiration set. Um, but we can see all the different members within that set. And so these, of course, were all the SKUs for the different events that we have labeled. And if you wanted to do it manually, you could remove them by pressing that X button on the right. But I wouldn't. Right. It. Um, and you can delete the entire set by uh, clicking on that garbage can. You can add a member by clicking on the plus, and you can refresh your view. Say maybe I was on my end working on this, and I was adding or removing members. You wouldn't see that. Uh, so you would have to click on refresh, and that would just give you a refreshed view of the set. Right. Yeah. I just wanted you to like, yeah, check out different aspects of this. Uh, the more we get uh, into the, the more higher complexity data structures, sometimes it just helps just to look at the data structure uh, with a different visualization. Um, and you see like Redis Graph, Redis Gears, Streams, Redis Time Series, Redis Search. Those are all different sections dedicated to the different modules that give you a really, really great visualization. Like Redis Graph, um, we don't actually cover that in, in RU101. But that's a graph database visualizer. And it looks really cool. There's edges, there's vertices, there's uh, data packed within all of it. It's a lot of fun. Nice, nice, definitely. Yeah, that is uh, that kind of reminds me of when I first started coding. Well, I didn't, not when I first started coding, but when I came back to coding more recently and went to bootcamp, and they said, "Right, you're going to do everything on the command line." And it's definitely a different way of looking at it, and it has its uses. But like you say, it's not always the best way of of looking at what you've got, is it? So it's really good that you can sort of more visually see this stuff and interrogate it 
without having to type in a bunch of commands and just looking at like just text that comes back to you. Yeah, exactly. For the for for those of us learners that like seeing things and tables with with borders and lines, it helps immensely. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure if it's my eyes, but those rows do look like they're slightly shaded as well. So you can yeah. actually like <laughs> see like the odds and evens, which is really good. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for going through all of that with me. I think yeah. we could call it there, can't we? And I can do the the rest of my homework on my own, especially now that I'm a little bit more confident with let's go on to Redis Insight and have a look because, yeah, the questions that I had done independently were the ones that I kind of thought, yeah, let's get a piece of paper and run this out. So, yeah, now that I can uh, go into the sandbox and, and have a look, then I will definitely try that uh, on my own before next week's session. Cool, cool. Yeah. Next week, um, we're going to be looking at transactions, which deals with sort of grouping uh, commands within Redis together and then executing them. That's going to be really exciting. It's going to be less uh, you know, deep into new um, data structures and more just like how to use the data structures that make sense, um, keeping them together, uh, grouping them, and then executing them. And this becomes pretty important. It kind of ties in with sort of performance as well. Um, so still not very scary. It's fun. We'll just have to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, no, it definitely is helping me to talk about this with you uh, on the streams as well. But for anybody who needs a buddy and they're watching the streams and everything, but you still need somebody to talk to, please join us over on Discord. We'll put the link up here for you to see. We'll also put it in the show notes if you good folks are watching it on um, YouTube as well. But yeah, please do join us on Discord. There's a dedicated channel for RU101. If you're stuck on anything, come in there. Me and Justin will be in there along with uh, Simon and everybody else from Redis University. So yeah, like I said at the top, um, so this course, the enrollments will actually close this coming Tuesday. So the 26th of October will be the last day that you can enroll to join this cohort. And this cohort ends on the 11th of November, which is the date by which you need to do all the assessments if you want to get your certificate before this cohort ends. But don't worry if you don't have time to do that. Uh, we are running these courses all the time. So as soon as this one finishes, the next one will start. But yeah, if you do feel like, you know, you've got three weeks now, essentially, to do RU101 uh, with me. And um, as you can see, like I said, it's taken me probably about an hour to go through the videos and do quite a lot of the homework independently per week. So, and I'm quite a rusty coder as well. So hopefully that gives you some kind of like indicator of how long it might take you. Um, then yeah, you, it's definitely achievable to get it done within the next three weeks, depending on what else you've got on. So don't worry, you don't necessarily need the whole six weeks and everything's self-paced as well. So you can, uh, you can definitely go back and do weeks one and two and three uh, all in one go if you have the time. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that is th those are the dates for this cohort. Sign up by next Tuesday, 26th, and finish the whole course by the 11th of November. Otherwise, sign up for the for the next one when it comes, when registration is open for that in a couple of weeks' time. Um, like I said, join us on Discord if you want to chat about anything in between the streams. The recording of this will be on YouTube very soon. Thanks so much to Justin and uh, Kyle, Josephine and Alex for getting these things up on YouTube so quickly as well. We've had a really good response on YouTube, actually. Uh, a lot of folks have watched, so I hope it's helping you. Uh, please do leave us a comment to let us know about that. One other thing, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed on my bookmarks, I've got quite a lot of Hacktoberfest bookmark at the top there. That's because Simon and I are managing um, Redis's participation in Hacktoberfest this year. We've put out quite a number of issues for you good folks to contribute to software and documentation, depending on what your bag is. And um, we Redis works with a lot of different languages as well. So uh, you might be able to find something that you can contribute to in your favorite language too, or at least related to it. So there's kind of a, quite a lot of different things there for uh, all different types of people. So go to developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest to read all about that. 
Uh, for those of you that don't know what Hacktoberfest is, it is an annual event sponsored by Digital Ocean. It's currently in its eighth year, and it's all about helping people to get involved with open source. So um, if you sign up on the Digital Ocean website, then they will send you swag if you if you meet the eligibility criteria. We are not responsible for allocating or sending out the swag. Digital Ocean are kindly handling all of that on behalf of the project. But what we are contributing is some issues for folks to get their teeth into. Simon and I will be back on Twitch at 9 a.m. UK tomorrow. Justin, hopefully, is going to be sound asleep in bed at that time. It's about 1 o'clock in the morning for you. So mm -hmm. 9 a.m. UK, 8 a.m. UTC tomorrow, Friday, the 22nd of October here on Twitch. We're going to be looking at some of the issues that folks have solved for us. And um, some of the innovation that we've seen there has been really good. It's like people have become so enthusiastic about this and we've been really happy to see it and um yeah and it's been really good for us to see how folks that maybe have never touched redis are able to pick up our apps and install them and get working with it and it's been a, a really good sort of eye-opener for us to see that as well so we're going to be showing you some of the things that folks have worked on and also like why we put it up as an issue so, you know, um, the people that I work with here, Justin, Simon and everybody else, all have a lot of expertise in Redis and their previous areas. But then some things, that, you know, when they're designing a demo app, they'll design it to demonstrate what they need to demonstrate about Redis. And then there's loads of nice to have things in there. But uh, yeah, don't take my word for it. Come and join us tomorrow and we will record that one as well. And we'll put that video up on YouTube. But yeah, if you don't manage to catch us, go to developer.redis.com slash Hacktoberfest to find out all about that and also look at all the issues that are currently up for grabs. There, there is a hint there will be more tomorrow. Um, we're going to be putting up some new ones. So yeah, like Justin said, we'll be back again next week. We'll be talking about transactions. No need to be scared. I always get a bit nervous before these, uh, these streams, but then once I get into it, it's all good. So yeah, no need to be scared of that. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much, Justin. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. See you next week. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody.